you want to play for another half an hour or so, and then we'll just go home, that'd be okay. Thank you. Do that. Definitely. Good evening. Uh, so two things before we uh, start tonight. I um, want to remind you, or if we didn't, weren't here with us last week. Um, I, I am aware that there is, I have this limitation, and it is difficult for me to come to you to bring you communion. Um, not difficult so much as risky <laughs> uh, to walk around and not want to drop the elements. So uh, if uh, you uh, would prefer not to come to the front for communion, uh, there will always be elements now in the back as you come in, and you can simply pick those up. And then during the communion liturgy, when I take communion, just join me at that time and receive the elements yourself as well. Uh, but those will uh, be there uh, now for at least the duration of my time here. Be sure, just want to be sure that you know that that's there. Uh, and then if you don't mind, just a bit of personal, a moment of personal privilege, because you have all been so wonderful and supportive. Uh, and sharing prayers for us. If you uh, don't know, our granddaughter, our first granddaughter, was born prematurely and has been in the hospital until last night. She came home last night. So, yes. So, um, so all is good. Her parents uh, went, had a, have had a sleepless night, and they have jealous dogs, so things are as they should be <laughs> in the world. Uh, so anyway, we're just very happy uh, that they're all home now, as are they as well. And so, of course, Grandma is with them doing grandma stuff, so good for grandma too. We begin our worship together with the order for confession and forgiveness, which you're going to find on page 94 in the Red Hymnal. We gather in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. God of all mercy and consolation, come to the help of your people turning us from our sin to live for you alone. Give us the power of your Holy Spirit that we may confess our sin, receive your forgiveness, and grow into the fullness of Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Let us confess our sin now in the presence of God and of one another. Let's uh, keep a moment of silent prayer here as we gather ourselves into the presence of of the God of all grace and mercy. Please pray with me. Most merciful God, we confess that we are captive to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. In the mercy of Almighty God, Jesus Christ was given to die for us. And for his sake, God forgives us all our sin. As a called and ordained minister in the Church of Christ, by his authority, I therefore declare to you the entire forgiveness of all your sin. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Our opening hymn, number 618 in the, green, in the red hymnal, uh, Guide Me Ever, Great Redeemer.
Let us pray. Lord God, our strength, the struggle between good and evil rages within and around us. The devil and all the forces that defy you tempt us with empty promises. Keep us steadfast in your word, and when we fall, raise us again and restore us through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The first reading is from Genesis, the second chapter, beginning at the 15th verse. The Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to till it and keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, You may freely eat of every tree of the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it, you shall die. Now the serpent was more crafty than any other wild animal that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, Did God say you shall not eat from any tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden. But God said, You shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the middle of the garden, nor shall you touch it, or you shall die. But the serpent said to the woman, You will not die, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was a delight to the eyes, and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took up its fruit and ate, and she also gave some to her husband, who was with her, and he ate. Then the eyes of both were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made loincloths for themselves. The word of the Lord. The second reading is from Psalms, the 32nd chapter, beginning at the first verse. Happy are those whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Happy are those to whom the Lord imputes no iniquity, and in whose spirit there is no deceit. While I keep silence, my body wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night your hand was heavy upon me. My strength was dried up as by the heat of summer. Selah. Then I acknowledged my sin to you, and I did not hide my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the guilt of my sin. Selah. Therefore, let all who are faithful offer prayer to you. At a time of distress, the rush of mighty waters shall not reach them. You are a hiding place for me. You preserve me from trouble. You surround me with glad cries of deliverance. Selah. I will instruct you and teach you the way you should go. I will counsel you with my eye upon you. Do not be like a horse or a mule without understanding, whose temper must be curved with bit and bridle, else it will not stay near you. Many are the torments of the wicked, but steadfast love surrounds those who trust in the Lord. Be glad in the Lord and rejoice, O righteous, and shout for joy, all you upright in heart. The word of the Lord. Amen. 
Well, good morning. How are you doing this morning? It's uh, so nice to be with you today uh, because today is a beginning of a very special time in the church. This is a season that we call Lent. Uh, and Lent is a time about 40 days long, uh, not counting all the Sundays, uh, that we use to really prepare ourselves for the most important day of the year for Christians, and that's Easter. This has been a part of the church's practice since the very beginning. Christians have always observed this season that they call Lent as a special time and, and to do special things to really be ready for when Easter comes. And so we have all of these exercises that we do. We spend more time in prayer or maybe Bible study or we go to church more often. We do things uh, that help us to really be ready when Easter comes so we can really celebrate this gift of life that God gives us in Jesus. And sometimes what we do during Lent is we give things up. Uh, we give up things to remind ourselves and to help us focus on what really matters. And so you'll hear people sometimes will give up meals or maybe they won't eat meat on a certain day or they'll give up something like chocolate. Uh, or something like that, just to help them be more focused and pay more attention to faith uh, so that when Easter comes, our faith is really strong and we really know what it means that God gave us life uh, in the resurrection of Jesus. So one of the things that we're all going to do together, we're going to all give up something that's a normal part of church. It's a word, right? And that word is Alleluia. Right? We say that word a lot in church. It's a great word. It's a praise word. It, it reminds us of how much we love God. And, and But we're going to want to really say that word on Easter Sunday. And, and so what we're going to do now is we're going to not say it for 40 days. In fact, I'm going to take this banner and I'm going to hide it in the church. And you come back on Easter Sunday and we'll bring it back out again and it will be wonderful and spectacular and we'll say hallelujah really loud uh, and we'll really celebrate the gift of Easter. And in between now and then, we will think about what does it mean that God should love us so much that he should give us this gift of life that sometimes we just take for granted. So we pay a little bit more attention now to all of that. We work a little bit harder at being stronger in our faith and being better followers of Jesus. And then come Easter, we will really celebrate that together. And I really hope that you'll be there with us. You have a really good day, a really great season of Lent. And we will see you next Sunday. The Holy Gospel for the first Sunday of Easter from the Gospel of St. Matthew, the fourth chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. He fasted 40 days and 40 nights. Afterwards, he was famished. The tempter came to him and said, If you are the Son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. But he answered, It is written, One does not live by bread alone but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him to the holy city and placed him on the pinnacle of the temple, saying to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, He will command his angels concerning you, and on their hands they will bear you up, so that you will not dash your foot against a stone. Jesus said to him again, It is written, Do not put the Lord your God to the test. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor and said to him, all these I will give to you if you will fall down and worship me. Jesus said to him, away with you, Satan, for it is written, worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Then the devil left him and suddenly angels came and waited on him. The gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Let's pray. Gracious Father, we struggle every day with temptations of every kind, and mostly with this temptation 
to go it on our own. It is hard for us to stay faithful and to not lose our trust. Now grant us this gift of your word and keep us close, close to you and close to what you made us to be. We ask that in Jesus' name. Amen. So, this, by the way, was one of the more PG versions of cartoons that I have in my library about this text. It, Genesis 3 fascinates me. You know, you, you preach the same text every three years, but, but you can never get away from Genesis chapter 3. You can never get away from this story. It is, in its own way, <coughs> really central to uh, what it means for us to be Christian, how we wrestle with this text. And it is one of these things that really sort of, it, everything seems to sort of hinge on. But I don't want to call any Bible verse silly, but let's face it, you got talking snakes, you got people putting on loincloths, you got all of this oddness, right, about this particular story. And, and that's unfortunate because this may be the most important point in the story of faith. So much of what we believe and do and teach and preach hinges on how we understand what this text is supposed to be about, this very important thing called sin. Because God says of the tree of this knowledge of good and evil, you will not eat. The day that you eat of it, you will die. Right? This is the end of whatever paradise was in the Garden of Eden and the beginning of whatever it is that we are journeying through now. This is the introduction of the very idea of death in the Bible. No mention of that prior to this moment. No risk, no problem, no challenge, no suffering, nothing until now. Until this stupid tree and Adam and Eve's interaction with it. The question is, what is it that really went wrong here? I mean, that we should call this moment the fall of humanity begs us to answer the question, well, what did they trip over? How did we fall? What does that mean? That's where we kind of get it wrong. It fascinates me, by the way, that so much of the conversation about this text seems to be about sex when there really is no sex in the story. Right? It's this. It's this, it's these words spoken by the devil, the serpent, the tempter, the father of evil, the liar. You will be like God, knowing good and evil. That's it, that's the whole thing right there. That is the words that matter. That's what sin is, coming and going. It's nothing less, nothing more than this temptation to be like God gods, which in the Hebrew to just be as gods. It's a little more generic in the Hebrew, but it's the same problem, right? This desire to, to go it alone, to be on our own, to, to be ourselves, to be in charge, to not need a god. It, it kind of fascinates me when you take this and you put it against the, um, the Matthew reading, the temptation. All of the temptations in Matthew come from the book of Deuteronomy. And Deuteronomy, a really important book in the Bible because it really has two lives. Right? Deuteronomy, in the words as they are originally given to the Israelites, come at a time as they are emerging from Egypt, emerging from slavery, becoming a people, becoming a nation for the first time in charge of their own life. And in that process, they are reminded that they are not actually going to be in charge of their own life. They will no longer be slaves to Pharaoh, but now they will be the people of God. And so they will have exchanged one kind of dependence for another. And if there was any thought that they were coming out of slavery and they were going to be on their own and make their own way, 
Moses is quick to remind them that that's not what this is about. Deuteronomy reemerges in the history of Israel after the exile to Babylon, the rediscovery of the Torah and the words as in the rebuilding of the temple. A, a time in history exactly the same as they come out of two generations of slavery and exile. What will they do? And the first word is, well, the first thing you will do is remember who's in charge. You are not God. And you are not to be like God. That is not your purpose. That is not your point. That is not why you are here. You are here to serve God. And see, this is our temptation, right? Because we all seek power. I mean, we all face that temptation every day. Not just power in the sense of we all want to be in charge and we all want to be the boss and we all want to tell other people what to do. That's a different sermon. No, the problem is, is that we all feel powerless. Life is hard. And there are all of these forces arrayed against us and all of these problems and, and diseases and challenges and corruption and evil. And we'd all like to have a little power. We'd all like to have a little say. <coughs> and in the midst of that, in the midst of that is that word that we say every Sunday in church at the end of that really important prayer. The kingdom, the power, the glory, those are God's, not mine. And the implication is that I, as a creature, am called to live a life where I give away power where I say no to power, where I even dare to be willing to be without power. You shall serve the Lord your God and him alone. That's a big deal. That's an easy temptation, not just to be in charge, but just to even have any little bit of control any little bit of say, any little bit of agency. And to be told that, in fact, agency is not a gift of the Holy Spirit. Responsibility is a gift of the Holy Spirit. See, that's a very different conversation of faith. That we are not called to be here to take control of our lives, to make ourselves a certain way to, to get it together, we are called, in fact, to be responsible. And instead of looking at all of the problems in the world and in our life and saying, man, I wish I could be in, do something about these things, instead to be told by God, hey, do something about those things. Not, I wish I could just, you know, win the lottery and make the bill chasers go away. It's, do something about injustice and inequity in the world so that everybody could make a go of it. Right? I mean, it, it's an interesting kind of, of way that the words play together. Right? I mean, we, we have this whole fruit of the tree, right, or the apple, as we tend to symbolize it, right? And, and, and it's the tree about knowledge. Right? If you eat the apple, you'll have knowledge. And, of course, if you have knowledge then you'll have control. Well, if I know what's going on, then I can do something about what's going on. And of course, that means I have power over what's going on. I mean, that's the play that runs all the way through this. But there's a more fun one. The humans. The word human is haram in the Hebrew, where we get the name Adam. And there is this lovely, lovely pun in the second chapter where God takes the dirt, the clay, the earth, and he takes a lump of it and he molds it into the person. And it's the same word. We are the people of the earth. We are made of ground. I, mean, I, I couldn't help thinking of that, that language that we often use when things seem totally out of control, that what you really just need is to be more grounded. Right? Wouldn't it be nice to just be a little bit more grounded, to have your feet on solid ground, to have some sense of, I, I think that's a fun pun. We are from the ground. 
And actually, you know, just the other day, we said those words. Or we were going to say those words. Oh, I'm sorry. Let me start with the psalm first. <coughs> These words from the psalm that we read tonight. I acknowledged my sin to you, and I did not conceal my guilt. Right? To just be who we are. Hey, I, I, I struggle. This is hard. And instead of trying to be more than what we are, why not be what we are? Luther said, sin boldly. And what he meant by that was to simply just be honest and not constantly trying to not be, well, I don't want to be a sinner. Well, I don't want to be a human. Well, I don't want to have temptations. Well, I don't want life to be hard. To say, well, I, I'm a sinner and I have temptations and life is hard. And I'm going to do my very, very best. But I don't expect to be God. And I understand that I'm going to trip and fall. And, and I'm going to take responsibility for that every single day. And I'm going to struggle as best I can. But I know that in the end, the only power I have is the power that God has given me by his spirit. The only control I have is the word that promises, is the word that promises that God will watch over me even in the midst of the de desert, even in the midst of the wilderness, even in the midst of the temptations. Because again, this is where we started this Lenten journey on Wednesday, or where we would have if the weather had cooperated. Right? Remember that you are dust. You are Adam. You are the earth creature. It's not a put down. It's not an insult or a degradation. It's a truth. A truth of a God who took that ground and breathed into it his very spirit and brought it to life. And now we journey every day in this wilderness carrying in us the life and breath of God, who walks through these hard times and calls us to just be faithful and to trust and to have hope when it is hard, and who promises us, quite literally, that we will be well if we will just be ourselves, if we will just be ourselves. The devil is trying to get ahead of Jesus by making him more than he is. I think that's interesting. Why would you want to be more than Jesus? Jesus accomplishes the redemption of the world by being exactly who he is. The human being come to serve and suffer for the sake of the dust. In Jesus' name, amen. The hymn is number 778 in the blues book. I just learned tonight that that little blue mark means it's in the blue book. <laughs> Very clever. Let's sing the first and last verse, shall we?
Living together in trust and hope now, let us confess our faith. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. With the whole people of God in Christ Jesus, now let us pray for the church, for those in need and for all of God's creation. Gracious Father, as we journey through the wilderness of this life, we are tempted. We wait for help. We are anxious and afraid, and so we take life into our own hands. We go our own way. And we forget that we are your creatures, that we are your beloved children. So now fill us with your spirit and with such faith that we might face the temptations of our days, that we might live out our life in faith. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. We have tried, O Lord, to build a world of our own creation. Now teach us to be responsible for the one you have given to us. Help us to do the things that are right and that are good, and let us be your instruments, your word, your light in this world, that by our faith many might know healing and help. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Gracious Father, we lift up to you our neighbors who are in trouble. We remember those who are suffering, victims of earthquakes in Turkey and Syria, those who are digging out from tremendous storms, those who are lost and alone and afraid, those who have no place to go. We ask, O Lord, that you bring help into this world, that you encourage us and empower us and use our small works to make a difference in the lives of all around us. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Father, we pray for our friends and neighbors in need this evening. And we remember those who are sick and those who are hospitalized, and those who are recovering from surgery, those who are fighting against disease. And we pray, Lord, for those who grieve this day, that they might know that you will carry them in their time of need. We ask, Lord, now that you look upon all who we name here before you, aloud and in our hearts. Max, Mary, Vincent, Gordon. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. All of these prayers, O oh Lord, we give to you, trusting in the grace and in the mercy that you give to us in Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. And now the peace of the Lord be with you all. Won't you share a sign of God's peace with one another? Shall we pray? God of good gifts, 
receive these and all our offerings as we present them in faithful service for the sake of your gospel. Prepare our hearts to receive you in this meal as you pour out the, your very presence through Christ Jesus, the wellspring of eternal life. Amen. And so it is that in faith and in hunger and in need and in hope, we come to this table trusting in God to fill us up. And so we remember our Lord Jesus Christ and how on the night that he was betrayed, he took the bread and he gave thanks to God and he gave it to his disciples and he said, take and eat, this is my body given for you. Do this, he said, and remember me. And again, after supper, he took the cup and he gave thanks to God and he gave it to them. And he said, this cup is the New Testament in my blood shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this, he said, and remember me. And so we pray together in the way he taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. For those of you communing in your pew or joining us now on the live stream, receive this gift of the grace of God. This is the body of Christ given for you. This is the blood of Christ shed for you.
Let's stand. Oh, yeah. Why not? Let's stand. <laughs> Habits. Now may the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you always in his grace. Amen. Embodied God at your table, we have tasted the goodness of Jesus. With the eyes of our hearts open to your promise, empower us to hear the needs of our neighbor and to touch the world with your love. Amen. Uh, announcements. I don't know if I have any announcements. She didn't send me anything, so I'm going to assume you're all good as you, as you are. <laughs> all right, sounds good. Uh, our final uh, hymn, number 319, uh, O oh Lord, throughout these 40 days. Well, Go in peace and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.